when there's one person sick, there's a sickness in the culture and in the community. And it made me realize that it's not him, it's me. Right? It's always us. If you're part of the family, if one of us is sick, all of us are sick. My child has tantrums. Which therapist can help me out? No therapist can help you out with your child. Go to the therapist to help you out with yourself. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more. More from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. Yeah, I'm thinking to talk about um, family healing. Mm. Big words. Big words. <laughs> and, you know, once we're starting going, once we're going past the individual, the, the meaning can take on a lot. Because you say individual healing and family healing could be husband and wife, could be the family, husband, wife, and children, could be the family of origin, yeah. could be the community, right? Right. Yeah, larger family. So we can keep expanding that. But the, the, so the, the question becomes... Um, I was going to have a couple of things. So num- number one, when I was sitting with Gabor Mate the other week, he referenced something. Um, I think the tribe he said was called the Lakota tribe or something. He said it's in his book, The Myth of Normal, that their tradition is that when a person becomes sick in the tribe, everyone goes around, goes to them and thanks them for... Um, thanks them for for doing that for the community right. so like to speak a torch bearer of kind of yeah sickness yeah interesting it, it, in other words it's a form of responsibility that everyone is taking within the tribe within the family to say there is someone sick what does that mean there is a sickness <laughs> present mm-hmm. and this person chose chose or didn't show or did bear it for us and bear it for us could mean a couple of different things one is they could have absorbed the sickness Mm -hmm. so now they have it and protecting others but another way of saying it is that they paid a price by becoming sick to inform us about the sickness that is in our midst yeah that lands And I think family healing is, it gets so much more um, importance when, when you expand it, right? When you expand it outside of just the individual, like you said, you know, like a husband and wife, them healing together can have ripple effects for generations. Huge, yeah. And so on and so forth. That's what we need to get to, right? Is everyone healed? Hmm. That's that. I think that's the idea. That's what um, Gabo was trying to illustrate with that point. Is that when there's one person sick, there's a sickness in the culture and in the community. But what do we do with sick people? We push them to the side. Exactly. Stand They're the sick the ones. Yeah. We're the healthy ones. Hmm. That's the <laughs> that's the assumption. That's what I wanted to say about. Um, family healing is that so often we put all of the attention on the person who's exhibiting the most obvious symptoms Mm -hmm. saying they must heal they must heal they must heal unfortunately sometimes they can't they're too weak to so the responsibility becomes on the ones which are healthier quote unquote because there's obviously a sickness but the responsibility becomes on the ones who are healthier to get even healthier mm. and to take responsibility for the health of the space in order for this to work. Yeah. Um, what does that look like? What, is it, what does family healing look like? Um, meaning, where do we start? If an individual is exhibiting um, set sickness, do we collectively come together? Is it a one-on-one, and then that doesn't like how do we how do we treat that person 
differently than than how most sick people are treated today, literally and figuratively? Is it a group effort? I think that the point of this is that when we see an illness now, right, the Western way of viewing an illness versus the Lakota way Mm. of seeing an illness is that I am separate from the illness. If I don't have this, I am separate from it Mm. versus let's use my personal experience. So um, I developed an obsession with a compulsion to um, unwanted sexual behaviors. Mm -hmm. I was doing things I didn't want. I would tell myself I didn't want to watch pornography anymore and I'd be back there. I tell myself I'm never going to hire a prostitute again and I did. Mm. So these were, this was my, the manifestation of my illness, so to speak. Right. And Let's talk within my relationship. For, for many years, my wife viewed it as, and she was super high level in this viewpoint, meaning that this is even what I'm saying is rare, that she had to support me in me getting healthy, which what does it mean, support me? She had to make room and space for me to attend meetings. She had to not give me a hard time if... I was meeting with my sponsor or meeting a sponsee. Or maybe she even had to help facilitate that. Or if I wanted to do a dinner and bring a few of them over, she would, mm. she would cook it. She was supporting. I was a sick one. And she was the one supporting it. At this point in time, if she was sitting on a third chair in this room, I think she would say that she recognizes that she doesn't have to support me. That wasn't... It never, never was about that. She has to get healthy. She has to get healthy. And if she truly believes that she's the healthier one of the two, then she has the larger responsibility to get healthier because there's more she can, the more she can do about it. So it's almost like if you're part of the family, if one of us is sick, all of us is sick. If one of us is sick and all of us are sick, and the one who is exhibiting the most symptoms should not be scapegoated by the rest of us to say, you got to heal, you got to heal, you got to heal. Right. Those of us who were speared the intensity of those symptoms should take additional responsibility on ourselves to heal ourselves. What I'm not saying is... What, what I'm not saying is to... Um, enable them and support them and to give them whatever they want right. necessarily depending on you know the specific illness that's manifesting. What I'm saying is is that if you have a family and there's one person with an illness and you have one per- if, if you have a couple and there's one person with a very serious illness and however that's an addiction or something else mm-hmm. and one person without and you have in your budget room for one person to go to therapy, I'm recommending that the healthier one go to therapy. That's what I'm saying. That's powerful. What? That's powerful. Yeah. Interesting perspective. And it makes sense. But our body works this way, right? If, um, if there's something not working, something else makes up for it and gets right. stronger. It goes in that's, overdrive, right? Goes, right, that's... That's what it does because it understands that that's not working. So you don't yell at it and say work. You rest. Right. You rest. You get healthy. We're going to work. So, and this is, this is so important when it comes to family, couples, relationships, parents, children. I see it all the time. It's a form of scapegoating. Hmm. We're scapegoating our children when we say that they're the ones with the problem and therefore they need to do X, Y, and Z. I had someone call me and say, um... I saw you do a podcast on psychedelics and I wanted to um, know what you thought about it for my son. I said, what's your son's story? He says, oh, you know, young 20s, um, recently had an incident where we're not 100% sure, but he may have attempted suicide. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, can you tell me a little bit more what's going on in the family? Is there anyone else who has anything? Is he, you know, the only child that's, 
struggling like this. And we go back, you know, back into the kid's childhood. And it was very clear from a young age that um, this, that the mom who I was speaking with could not accept and love this child. Today he was acting out in mm. intense ways. So after we said, you know, went through the whole stories, regardless of whether he attempted suicide or didn't attempt suicide, he was struggling a lot, struggling mightily. So what I said to her, and I don't think she heard it at all, I don't think anything was done, I said, this is obviously an emergency, right? You're calling me because there's an emergency with your son, and right. you want my opinion on it. I think that any treatment, and if you want to explore psychedelics, I mean, speak with, you know, professionals or otherwise who can guide you on, on these things, but I, I think everything should be explored obviously, but for you. She's like, why for me? <laughs> well, first of all, because you're the one calling me and your son's not. But second of all, look how sick he is. But you've also told me that at a very young age, you couldn't accept him. So maybe he's not that sick after all. Maybe he's reacting very normally to a very abnormal situation. Mm. To quote Viktor Frankl again, a normal response to an abnormal situation is abnormal. Right. So if this child is acting abnormally, what is the abnormal circumstance that's existence and who's responsible for that? Certainly not the child in a parent-child relationship, but I would say that it's, it's not only because of the parent-child relationship. He's the one exhibiting the strongest symptoms. Let him rest. Mm. You heal. You figure out why you can't accept him. Normalize the situation, and then he'll be more normal. But most people can't hear this. Why can't, why can't they hear it? Yeah, why because do they don't want to hear it. Mm. Because it's always more painful to deal with our stuff than it is for someone else to deal with their stuff. So we always want someone else to. And that's why I call it scapegoating children. But we can be scapegoating children, scapegoating our spouses, scapegoating other people in society. They're the sickest ones. They've let us know how abnormal the, the situation is. Oftentimes, they're the most sensitive ones. Yeah, I think of my kid, my seven-year-old son, Sincere. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've been kind of butting heads a little bit. And... Um, it wasn't until this morning, which we talked about in a previous episode, like that um, sort of like tough morning that um, something was said to me that it was like a mirror, right? Like, so I was like, one of the things that me and Sincere were going back and forth on was just sort of like his mood, right? And as his dad, I'm like, you're seven years old. Why are you like always coming off like grumpy all the time, mm -hmm. right? Like he just woke up, like be happy. And I'm like, you know, trying to cheer him up and all this stuff. And he's just been grumpy. And then fast forward, um, my wife brought it to my attention. We were talking and she was like, how many times have I called you grumpy? And in that moment I was stuck because over the years, it's one of the things I've, I for sure know about myself. I can be very like moody at times. And then it made me realize that it's not him, it's me. Right? It's always us. Yeah, it's always us. He's displaying the, the symptoms, but it's sort of because he absorbed, like you said, my sickness in that, you know? And maybe he's just mirroring what he sees. And it was a, a powerful opportunity to kind of look at it and, and just look at him differently in that moment. Like, you know, he feels what I put out. Right. Even if it's like, not not necessarily like a, an obvious thing, like he's a kid. That's all they're doing, sponge mode, 24-7. Right, they become a mirror, and sometimes an exaggerated mirror, right? Because right? we can't quite see what's, uh, what's there. Did you ever hear this, that um, Charlie Chaplin went to a look-alike competition, a Charlie Chaplin look-alike competition, no. and lost? <laughs> <laughs> because the look-alike is always an exaggerated version of, mm. of it. So the mirror we need is an exaggerated version right, right. of what we're doing, and then it's irritating us. And you say, why are you so grumpy? Mm. And then you just say, ask yourself, why are you so grumpy? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why are you so grumpy? And I'm grateful for that because I think um, 
kids can be, you know, some of our greatest teachers. And just thinking, going back to what you're saying about um, family healing, uh, I think kids can often be a beacon for that. Oh man, because it's there's nothing there. There's no muck. There's no there's nothing. If a kid is acting up, there's right. something in the right in the soup. Right. That's that's not good. I was having um, trouble with um, my son a little bit ago, and I said to my wife, I said, let's just try no screens for a week. Let's see what happens. Zero. Like mm. zero, zero, zero. And I wouldn't say we're a family that has screens a lot. We do our best to entertain. But, you know, sometimes it's six in the morning. Need a pacifier. <laughs> kids wake, kid wake up. You're not ready to wake up. There was another, we got three young kids, right? So there was another one who was just up at one in the morning. <laughs> the battle like, cry. <laughs> okay, here you go. You know, Coco Melon, you know? <laughs> so, and you get an extra half hour, 45 minutes of sleep. And then the whole day is just that much more rough. Right. And you're constantly, you know, right. the kid. Why are you behaving this way? Why are you behaving this way? So let's just try without the screens. Let's see what happens. Mm. Man, jumping around, excited. None of the tantrums, like all of it disappeared. He's responding to the, to the filth that we're putting in his environment. Mm. Right? That, that shouldn't be there. This programming is deep. You can't tell me these screens are not screwing up a lot of For us sure. in real ways. For sure. And he's responding to that. And even though he's not the only one, to this he's the most sensitive. Mm. Oh, my child has tantrums. Which therapist can help me out? No therapist can help you out with your child. Go to the therapist to help you out with yourself because you're the one creating the environment that your child's reacting to. And they're pure. They haven't been here as long as us. Right. They've, they're less tolerant, so they're going to let us know. That's why kids are always getting sick. We build up these resistance to it. Right. You ever went on a, um, a juice cleanse uh, for yeah. any period of time? Mm -hmm. You ever eat like some, like after a juice cleanse, a potato chip? You're like, oh, what is, it? Yeah. what is that? It feels crazy. Right, but eat potato chips every day for two years. Right. Like Red 40, yellow, <laughs> like all this stuff. We're indestructible. We're drinking right. drinks that have colors that should never be consumed. Right. But we're indestructible, but we're not. But you give it, you'll give it to a child and you'll notice it right away. There's something. Yeah. You know? and that's a great point, man, because our body um, has like this amazing ability to like heal and regenerate. But that doesn't mean we should take advantage. And I use that like in the context of healing. Like don't, we should not overlook the importance of healing, family healing. Because, yeah, we might survive this generation. Right. But what are we passing on? What are we leaving behind? And I think oftentimes we're killing our most sensitive. That's what's happening. Mm. We're killing. I've seen it in the, um, in the religious community big time, big time, big time, big time. Like where I grew up, there's this idea of, um, you know, those who choose not to be religious. And I, I was one of those. I chose to be a lot less religious. But one of the things I said when no one heard me when I said it, I said, you don't think I wish that this stuff gave me crazy meaning the way it seems to give to you? Mm. That I would just feel amazing wearing those clothes, reading that book of Psalms and feeling like I'm recreating universes and everything is happening for multi-generations that are better off because of it, mm. which you say happens, but I don't feel that. I don't feel that. If you do, I'm, I'm jealous of you. Mm -hmm. But because I don't, I'm going to do things differently. Um, but instead of saying, okay, so, so what's up? Because I believe that that's what they're saying, right? They're choosing a whole lifestyle based on these, based on these things. So many religious people, and I don't speak only to my community, they're choosing a whole lifestyle based on these beliefs. Mm -hmm. And someone is now rejecting it. Your child is now rejecting it. And the viewpoint that I've seen most common is that um, the child is lazy, disinterested, and therefore they don't have the discipline to do X, Y, and Z the right way. Should I tell you what I found? Yeah. I found that the people who reject it, oftentimes, oftentimes, not 100%, nothing's a 100% rule, are the most sensitive, the most pure, the most intolerant of bullshit, and that's why they leave. Mm. Because they can't take it. They cannot take it. I met a young, 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 20, 21 years old a few years ago. 
and he was struggling a lot. And his parents asked me to talk to him. And, you know, I'm chatting with him and I'm asking if anything happened in his background, like any abuse, any major trauma. And I was like, no, 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 no. And it wasn't until maybe spending 10 hours or so with him that I believed him. There wasn't any major trauma. Mm. And in speaking to his parents a little bit later, I said, you know what I think his trauma is? Like just seeing hypocrisy. He just can't. Zero tolerance for it. Mm. Zero. He cannot. He cannot understand someone getting up in the room talking about God and he knows the guy doesn't believe anything he's saying. He knows it. He cannot stand to hear one more speech, one more speech from someone who talks about relationships and honesty and he knows that that person has a garbage relationship with his own wife. He can't. Mm -hmm. So instead of listening to him and saying, wow, help us fix what's here, help us fix what's here, we throw him out. And we say, this guy's the one with the problem. Medicate him, change him. No, no. Listen to him. This guy has the most important lessons for you. He's telling you what's wrong. That's why we thank him. But he's telling you what's wrong. He's not telling you what's wrong. To tell you what's wrong is easy. He's showing you what's wrong. He's taking all of the illness in and of himself. And he's saying, I can't handle it here. I can't. He's vomiting the whole experience. He's showing you. This is vomit worthy what you're putting in front of me. This thing is not right. And that's what's happening with so, so much of us. Cancer and other illnesses and everything else. Let's pay attention. Let's pay attention. Why is this happening? What is the soup that we're sitting in? And then the most sensitive ones are getting sick. And they say they're the sick ones. Mm. They're not sick. They're our teachers. They're the best. It's the same like kids getting sick. I want that, you know, you mentioned about um, your son with the... Uh, um, the grumpiness and you showing that. So uh, just the way, the way our kids are teachers is just nuts, like absolutely yeah. insane. So I had one a few weeks ago I want to share. Uh, so my son for the last like, I don't know, six months or a year, it's this whole goodbye ritual with me, <laughs> this whole ritual. And he's like, um, I love you, daddy. I miss you, daddy. I'll see you later, daddy. Bye, daddy. I love you, daddy. One more hug, another hug. And at first it was cute. And then, you know, the school would start complaining about it. <laughs> what is this thing? We're letting him, why can't you do it down the block? I said, I did. <laughs> I did. He does it again here. Right. And then I'm, I'm driving away and he's screaming at me, bye, daddy. I love you, daddy. The whole school, the whole school, school hearing this. And um, I am start talking to him, right? I've got to teach him, right? Tell him. Why don't we just say it one time? We'll do it this way. We'll do it that way. How about if I say it first? Is there... How did you uh, feel in that moment telling him, like, let's ease up on the hugs and the... I wasn't the telling... Right. I wasn't, I, I, was, I wasn't saying it in that way. I said, maybe we'll do it before we leave. We'll do it in the car. Mm. And then maybe we'll do it before we get in the car. And then maybe we'll park a block away. Like, do we need to do it in this way? <laughs> do we need to do it in this way? So I was talking to him. I thought I was being a good father. But I was trying to change him. I wasn't listening to him. And then a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a guest over at our house. And um, my wife's friend and my son loves her, like absolutely loves her. <laughs> so <laughs> when, when she was leaving, he was saying like, bye, bye, see you later. And uh, he's like, bye, Monica, bye, Monica, I'll see, you. <laughs> I'll see you later. And as, he, like, as he's walking back to me, he says, daddy, say goodbye. Daddy, say goodbye. So I, I didn't listen right away. And he's like, say, say goodbye to Monica. So I walked over to her car and I said goodbye and left. And I was thinking about that. And I'm like, you know something? He's like, I don't do that properly. I don't. I don't, I don't say goodbye properly. I've never done it my whole life. I don't. The amount of For times. sure. <laughs> well, I don't. Right? You agree? All right. A hundred percent. Dude, what I realized then, it was like it hit me like a ton of bricks. It, was, it wasn't just like say goodbye. What is say goodbye? What is that? say goodbye. It's not just someone leaving the house, you can see them that night. There are so many relationships we have to say goodbye from in different ways. We've said goodbye multiple times in our relationship. Mm -hmm. We worked, you worked with me in the cell phone business and then we worked on a charity project and then we stopped and then we started working again. There were times, but I guarantee you I never said goodbye properly to you. Right. I never once did. And what I notice is 
there are a lot of people out there who've developed, not a lot of people out there, there are a number of people who I've worked with and had close relationships with who, for whatever reason, life shifted and transitioned, and I'm not as focused on that today, and now I'm more focused on this, and I did not say goodbye properly. I didn't. That transition never happened. I didn't explain to someone why, um, when I was more focused on business, I was talking to them a lot. And then I stopped, and they started talking to someone else. And I didn't say, hey, you know, I'm transitioning to spending some of my time doing this recording, mm -hmm. for example. And therefore, I'm going to be less available. But you can reach me in this way, the exact same way we say goodbye to kids. Yeah. Bye. I'll see you later tonight. If anything happens, don't worry. You can call me. But I wasn't doing that properly. And he was trying to show me that. And then I tried changing him. Mm. But eventually, he got the message. I eventually he didn't get the message. I got the message. You got the message. I got the message. So I think there's a couple different points in this um, in this conversation, but really what this all brings it back to is when we look at ourselves. When I say ourselves, like us, as once one as, as one organism, and then there's multiple organisms within the organism. So there's the organism of society. There's the organism of our country, of our city, of our. Um, business, of our family, of our immediate family. And with each one of those, the responsibility is on those who think they are the healthiest to do the lion's share of the work so that the rest can rest while they're given the opportunity to, to heal as well. And on and on and on we go until more and more of us get healthy. But if we keep calling the sick ones sick, We'll stay in the soup of dysfunction for much longer than we can tolerate. Amen.